Jenny did a degree in Italian and French. Um, and the initial interest then was prompted by that knowledge of Italian and the development of it as a national language and the consequent, consequent political difficulties that it caused, which became the focus of Jenny's MA dissertation in Southampton. So during the initial research that Jenny did in Rome, she found some correspondence to Gramsci, which was largely unpublished and so unknown. And the women in his life, so his mother, his wife, and his sister-in-law had no voice. And ultimately, as a result of that, were completely marginalized from the stories about him. Now, some of their letters are published, but not in English. So the letters and the women remain unknown to English speakers. And during the research for Jenny's PhD, whenever she spent time in the Rome archive, she also spent time with the sisters. So it gradually became the study. So they're significant, not just to Gramsci, but they're also significant in their own right. And that's what led Jenny to work on the monograph. And having seen Jenny myself a couple of times in the British Library, I can attest to the struggle that, that went on in terms of engaging with this and also doing the translation, which is just amazing from my perspective anyway. Um, so Jenny's backgrounds, a whole range of things in terms of teaching from infants to young people who are facing challenges with A-level language teaching and then adult education, which Jenny describes as her real passion. So during her career did various things, including the development and validation of accreditations for adult learning and access courses for an open college and access network at Brighton University. And then in West Sussex, she did three European projects on language based learning with them, immigrants, as well as developing quality standards for teaching and learning and training for part time tutors and also senior managers. Um, as many of us already know, Jenny loves Italy and loves traveling in Italy for the food, the wine, the art, the architecture, the landscape, the sunshine. There's a whole range of things there that, that many of us would relate to who also love Italy. And uh, like many of us indeed, can't wait for the opportunity to go back. So without further ado, Jenny, may I hand over to you? Um, I'm sorry we haven't managed to get Andrew in yet, but we will keep working on that. And we're looking forward to hearing about uh, the barbed wires, these barbed wires, wire, wire barriers. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes? No? We, we can. Right. OK. So as, uh, uh, thank you for that, Anne. And uh, uh, as you said, I, this was all really a mistake. Well, not a mistake, but completely by chance that this whole thing started um, because doing an MA, as you said, uh, Gramsci came up um, just as a topic of one of the lectures. And in it, it was uh, he was described of having been brought up in rural Italy without really any more details than that. So when I asked where in rural Italy, and they said Sardinia, my ears pricked. And I said, but that's terribly important because Italian wouldn't have been his first language. And so Michael being Michael said, write me the essay. And that's really where it all started. Um, and the second chance really was that while I, I had to go to Rome, well, I mean, one does, doesn't one? I had to go to Rome because I needed to look at the only copy that still exists of the language notes which Gramsci wrote out for his tutor on glottology, which is the way that languages develop and change in the face of social pressure or, or whatever. And when, I, when I'd done that, um, a couple of long hot days spent in the old institute, I noticed that stacked in one of the, the rooms, there were these cardboard boxes labelled, you know, correspondenza with the years. And I said, well, whose were they? And they said, well, they were the correspondence to Gramsci. So I signed them out and there they were, the letters from his mother and from his wife and from various other things. But the letters from the women, of course, attracted me first, not least the letters from his mother are very blotchy um, because she's obviously used a dip pen and cheap ink. But there are what look to me distinctly like tear stains on them. Either she's wept or he's wept over these letters while he's in prison. So that was sort of interesting and, and engaging to start with. And then there were the letters from Julia, which were written in pencil. And over the years, because obviously I couldn't afford to go to Rome all that often, they were obviously fading. 
um, and nobody else seemed to be interested in them. And so, I, as Anne said, I started to translate them because I thought they're going to be lost soon. And then they took them out completely for a couple of years while they put them online. So it was a couple of years before I could do anything at all. So that's why it's all taken so long, because you can only access these letters if you go to Rome. And fairly obviously, one can't trip off to Rome all that often. So um, that's why they've taken so long to translate. And in the process of translating them, I realised that that the perception of Julia, which is in the biographies, was actually most unfair. Um, and this is partly because all this material is stacked away in cardboard boxes and nobody sees it. So um, gradually I began to feel that we needed to look at the Shoup sisters and we look, needed to look at them as people as well. So, he, so I started the book and I've st I pegged it to Gram, although it's about the women and their relationships with Gramsci, I've pegged it to his life simply because we have the data about his life to give us a timeline. And that gives you, you know, the line on which to peg all the other information and a reference as to what's happening with, with the letters and when they happen. So I start really the book, apart from the introduction, which says more or less what I've said here. Um, I start the book with a quick chapter on Gramsci himself, which whizzes through his childhood and his early life in Turin, and then uh, focuses on the period in Turin when he's already become a journalist between 1915 and 1922, because this is a very short, this is a very short life, sadly. So there's, so between 1915 and 1922, he's a, he's a journalist in Turin. And in 1919, he founds the famous journal, the Ordine Nuova, with um, what the biographies explain as the three friends, Togliatti, Tasca and Terracini. And Gramsci himself says are four friends because he includes Pia Crena, his girlfriend, who in fact runs the office and keeps the whole thing together. So, but we'll talk about Pia Crena another time. She's a whole nother story. Um, so in from 1919 to 1920, the Ordine Nuovo is very influential in the factory council meet, council meet. Um, movement, which is about the workers not just negotiating about paying conditions, but negotiating about having more power in the whole relations of the factory, the whole running of the factory. This is not popular with the unions or with the Socialist Party. The unions, because you don't have to belong to anything to go to a factory council, and the Socialist Party, because apart from running the factory, apart from talking about the factory councils, he's also very critical of the Socialist Party, which is not doing, in his view, enough um, in terms of political movement or organisation or anything. So, um, so the 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 Socialist Party and the unions are pretty hostile to the factory movements. Then in 1920, thereafter, uh, the, the employers have locked the workers out and then there have been various other strikes and so on. The workers, against his advice, lock the employers out and take over the factories. So there is factory occupation of Fiat, um, several of the big me metallurgical companies. There is a big movement. Um, but, and the factories work, and they carry on producing, um, and it so nearly succeeds. There is so nearly a socialist revolution starting in, in Turin, but he hasn't got the support of the rest of Italy. And of course, finance is always going to be a problem because they need more money coming in to buy the materials and they need to be able to sell their products and so on. So in the, in the event, they are defeated by society as a whole. And of course, Gramsci, in the meantime, has carried on criticising the Socialist Party, but at the same time has been very unwilling to leave the Socialist Party in order to form a new Communist Party. So after the Factory Council debacle, when the reprisals start and people are chucked out of work and the paying conditions go back down again and so on and so forth, he actually does join Bordiga and uh, they go to the big Socialist Party convention in Livorno 
in January 1921, and they are actually thrown out of the Socialist Party and they form the new Communist Party 100 years ago this year. Um, and uh, Gramsci forms part of one of the committees in that, but not the leading committee because he hasn't done enough um, to make himself important enough to be in the leading committee. Um, and But he's still important enough to be taken with the with the Communist Party delegation when they go to Rome, go sorry, when they go to Moscow for the next Internazionale in 1922. So he goes off with Bordiger and the rest um, to Moscow. He's obviously absolutely exhausted and very, very ill. And he's taken ill when he gets there to the extent that the Soviet government say that um, he must go and be treated in Serenyenry Bor. I hope I've got that right if Derek's around, you'll correct me. Um, because he's simply too ill just to stay in the hotel. And so he goes off to this place, which is partly a wellness centre and partly recuperation, partly a hospital. And of course, he's terribly bored and lonely because he can't, he can't speak Russian. He doesn't know anyone. So somebody has the bright idea that he should be introduced to a fellow patient who does speak Italian and her name is Eugenia Schutt. So that's where chapter one ends and so we, off we go to um, off we go to uh, Russia to the uh, to this recuperation centre and I always wondered that even the first time I read Gramsci's biographies who this Eugenia Schutt was because this was a very exclusive clinic for members of the party and the upper echelons and visiting dignitaries and so on. So what was this woman who spoke Italian doing there? Well, the reason she's there is because the Schuchts were actually personal friends of Lenin and Kripskaya. And Eudania Schucht has been working with Kripskaya in Lunacharsky's education department, um, working on the reform of Soviet education and Soviet schools and of teacher education. So when she collapses, it's Krupskaya herself who insists that a place should be found for her. Um, and then uh, we also look at the Shuk family as a whole and the relationships within the Shuk family, some of which are rather... Apollon is very, the father is very controlling and there is a very suffocating relationship that has been there since childhood between Eugenia, who's in this um, recuperation centre, practically paralysed with exhaustion and depression and so on, and her younger sister, Julia, and he, she has dominated and controlled Julia from the minute of Julia's birth. Uh, but her, she introduces um, Gramsci to Julia when Julia comes to visit her and Gramsci admits later it's sort of love at first sight he walks into the room and there's this stunning tall slim stunningly beautiful woman in the corner and he sort of backs out absolutely gobsmacked um, but he carries on the relationship with, with Eugenia, which has become really quite close and intense. And he's persuaded her to start walking and he listens to her for hours and he tells her jokes. And they've got very, very close to the extent that Eugenia has actually asked Kripskaya to ask Molotov to organise a trip for her so that she can go back to Italy with Gramsci and she can work with him. So it's not just people chatting in a room. This is obviously quite serious from Eugenia's point of view. Um, and in fact, she writes to her and they sound like love letters and so on, but he's fallen for Julia. And so he leaves Eugenia and marries Julia. And that's something that Eugenia will neither forgive nor forget ever. And, and she will be really nasty for the next 15 years until he dies. And then of course she remembers how lovely it all was. So um, Julia and Gramsci work together and travel together as he goes around all the factories and gives speeches and so on. And then eventually they marry um, in September, we're told, 1923, although there are some doubts about that date and whether in fact they ever get married. But then they almost immediately separated in November. He is sent to Vienna. 
uh, to liaise with the Austrian Communist Party and also with the Italian Communist Party because most of the executive committee in Italy are in and out of prison because they keep getting arrested and somebody has to take charge. So off he's sent to Vienna um, and almost immediately there are problems. He begs her to come and join him. She prevaricates, he doesn't know why. And then it transpires that she's pregnant. Her father has put his foot down. She can't possibly go to Vienna. It's much too dangerous. This is the man who sent her across Europe in the middle of World War I, completely on her own. But it's too dangerous for him to go to Vienna. And it's obvious that there are underlying problems and tensions within the family. So then we, we don't have any of Julia's letters to him in Vienna. They've all disappeared. They probably, they've either been confiscated in one of the um, police searches of his rooms when he went back to Rome, or they were packed up and hidden away somewhere and no one's ever found them. So we don't have Julia's letters to him, but we do know that she wrote, that she wrote regularly, that they were loving letters and that they were entirely in communication at that point. So he goes back to Vienna and he's there till about April. And then, having discovered that she's pregnant and he's absolutely ecstatic about it, um, he's elected to the Italian parliament. This is chapter three. So he goes back to Rome. He can't go to Moscow on the way. He's heartbroken about that because the administration people haven't found the tickets and they haven't organised the papers and, you know, the usual story with administration. Uh, so he's elected to the Italian parliament and he has to go back to Rome. Um, and so the minute he gets back there, of course, he's saying, please, please come and join me. You know, I realise you can't come to the baby's born, but surely you can come afterwards and, and, and so on. But he's really very, very busy himself. He has to prove to the Italian party members that he's worthy to take over from Bordica, who's been in prison. And so he's zigzagging across Italy and going to meetings. And, and then there's the Matteotti crisis crisis which almost topples the fascist government and then on top of that the Schult family although they are actually hostile to the marriage have found him a job to do he's got to try and find Tatiana the third sister who's remained in Rome she remained in Rome to finish her medical degree because she was studying to be a doctor having finished a science degree so these are not non-entities these women these are competent professional women um, he's, he's, um, he has to find Tatiana, and Tatiana avoids him. Like all the shoot, she has a horror of being told bad news, and she's perfectly convinced that he's coming to tell her that somebody's died. So she keeps moving house and avoiding him until finally he tracks her down. And they get on like a house on fire. And they begin to spend a lot of time together and she begins to translate for him and act as his secretary and personal assistant. So she's in communication with the party. Um, she falls in with his plans to bring Julia to Rome and they house hunt and she buys presents for him to take back to Moscow when he nips back for three weeks to see Julia and the baby. Um, so they get, they're really getting on very well. But Gramsci back in Moscow discovers that Eugenia has more or less taken his first son Delio over from Julia. She insists on being called his mother. Delio is being taught to, to call both of them mother, both Julia and Eugenia, much to Apollon's disgust. But he does manage to persuade Julia that she has to come back to Rome. Um, she can't come back unless Eugenia comes with her, which I suppose is fair enough. A five day journey with a toddler in tow is much easier if you've got someone with you to help. So Eugenia and Julia are going to come to Rome. And so um, Tatania helps him to find an apartment. And once again, the problems turn up. She first of all finds an apartment that would be big enough for the, all of them to live in. That's Gramsci, Julia, Eugenia, Tatiana, the baby, and, you know, any friends and relations that want to come. And Eugenia from Moscow absolutely vetoes that. She won't come unless they can have an apartment which does not include Gramsci because it won't be safe, which is, which is of course, nonsense. But Gramsci wants her to come, so he agrees. So this 10 months when they arrive in October 25 and leave, no, I think it's actually closer to Christmas, and then they stay, Julia stays until July the following year. Those months are the only time that Granchi and Julia spend 
together in anything like a family setting. Of course, it isn't because he's living somewhere else and goes back home every night, in, in theory at least. Um, so it's although it's joyful and he spends a lot of time with his son as much as he can and looks back with it with with nostalgia and and, and happiness from prison. Um, they do actually have Julia and Gramsci have very little real time together. Obviously, they're, when he goes there in the evening, there's Eugenia, Tatiana, Julia, the baby. Neil de Perilli often comes as a guest for the night. Eventually, in January, Apollon shoot arrives. So it's hardly a tete a tete. But they do manage to find some private time together because Julia becomes pregnant again. A fact that she conceals for as long as she possibly can from Eugenia. Because Eugenia, in the meantime, has written venomous letters to Apollon, which is why he's arrived, describing Gramsci as dominating and um, not allowing Julia to, to be herself and hinting at sort of sexual perversions, which is absolutely not true as far as we can tell. And Julia herself has written saying how difficult it is to be with Gramsci again. She feels herself torn in all directions, which I think is highly likely since Eugenia is always there hanging on her skirts, telling her what to do. So I don't think it's just Gramsci she's having problems with, it's Eugenia as well. So the time is also stressful as well as being joyful. And we know that Eugenia and Tatiana quarreled because Eugenia wanted to be in charge and Tatiana wasn't going to let her, that they have absolutely no idea how to cope with the baby. Um, and Julia is very unhappy about the, the amount of time that Delio insists on monopolising, that um, Eugenia insists on monopolising Delio. So it's not unmixed joy, this period. However, that Julia does stay until the following July, and then she starts on her way back to Moscow, forced by Eugenia to do so, on the grounds that it will be dangerous to have the baby in Italy, which was absolute nonsense, because Julia by then was working for the Soviet embassy and therefore had diplomatic immunity, so there'd be absolutely no problem with the security um, services at all. But she goes back to... Um, Russia and so that's the last time actually that Gramsci will ever see her she just leaves to have the second baby and that's that so then the next chapter is about Gramsci's relationship with Tatiana as it grows and develops when he's in prison because he's arrested about six weeks after Julia goes back to Russia and first of all he's sent to Ustika which is what was called sort of political political exile. So that's a little tiny island off Sicily, which was, you know, relatively, relatively pleasant. But in Ustica, he makes two very important decisions, um, a, a sort of a, a split decision. He makes the decision that he will not write abroad, meaning that he will not write directly or clandestinely to the party. And abroad also in the sense that he won't write directly to Julia. He will write via Tatiana. And this was partly because, at least in Ustica, it would have been almost impossible to write to Russia because it was so backward that they sold cigarettes singly and the woman in the shop couldn't work out how much to charge for a packet because nobody ever bought a packet of cigarettes. They only ever bought them one by one. So the chances of them finding out how much it would cost to send a letter to Russia are pr pretty remote. Plus the fact that, of course, um, once he realised he was going to be in prison properly, the idea of trying to send a letter to Russia and receiving letters from Russia direct, he, I, think, I expect, as he feared, that that would have um, created huge problems as far as censorship was concerned. But he also writes via Tatiana because he simply can't bring himself to write directly to Julia. Once he realises that all his letters are going to be read, he's completely inhibited. He can't write anything at all. So he makes this um, really very drastic decision which will rebound on him dreadfully in later years that he will always write via Tatiana.
So that's why the relationship with Tatiana becomes so important. And so in this chapter, I, I sort of explore how it, how it develops with Tatiana. And um, he always thinks of us as, as a dearly beloved sister. I say always, it, it slides occasionally and he comes very close to thinking that he loves her and she comes very close to declaring that she loves him and obliquely does so several times, but then they both draw back. And at one point, finally, he says, you do everything for me. I'm terribly grateful for it to you. But there are situations in one person in which one person, however fond I am of them, cannot replace another. In other words, you're not Julia, and I will never love you the way I love Julia. Julia is my wife, end of story. And from that point, in a way, it all gets more easy because it's been clarified. They both know where they stand. She's a very dear friend. He absolutely relies on her. He can't do without her. He loves her dearly, but Julia is his beloved. And and so from there, we all know where we are. But in the meantime, they talk about, he and Tania talk about everything. She's not just his housekeeper sending him food parcels, which is the impression you get from some of the biographies, you know, the little woman role in the background. They talk about books, they talk about films, they talk about theatre, they talk about family, they talk about their respective medical problems. There aren't many people with whom one can discuss one's bowels, after all. Um, and they argue, <laughs> once very bitterly indeed, actually, there's almost a rift about a film that she's seen, which he says is anti-Semitic propaganda and typical Austrian and... Um, you know, she shouldn't be watching it. She should know better. And, and she gets very upset about it. And uh, there are cues that he misses about the tensions within the Schuch family. But he relies on her. Absolutely. And in a, in a way, this produces strains because it's very difficult to be cross with someone that you're also terribly grateful to at the same time. So there's always going to be strains in that. Um, and he, besides the medical support, which she supplies in a way that this prison to which he's been sent doesn't, although it's supposed to, um, she also acts for him with the authorities um, arguing for reductions in the sentence for better medical care, um, perhaps possible exchanges. And as far as can, Gramsci's concerned, apart from the medical care, she always gets it wrong. So he writes some vituperative letters about how she's mismanaged his affairs and then immediately regrets them and writes a letter of apology. Well, he apologises for the tone, but not always for what he said. And, and he becomes, these become worse as he gets more and more ill and knows he's getting more and more ill. And he's in ter terrible pain. I mean, his teeth all drop out with abscesses. He gets abscesses on his spine. He's in awful pain a lot of the time. So it's not surprising he's bad tempered. Um, but they also, and importantly, argue about his relationship with Julia and the fact that he's not writing to her, that he's refusing to write. Um, and in a way, the long gaps in the letters are not Julia's fault because one of the things he didn't reckon for with the logistics of sending the letters via Tatiana was that because Tatiana was not very strong and was often ill for months on end, this obviously created a break in communications because she couldn't collect letters if she was in hospital, which she often was, nor could she transfer his letters on. So there were bound to be great chunks of time in which nobody could send a letter to anybody because Tatiana in the middle in the hub wasn't wasn't doing her job so it also looks I also look then at Tatiana's role as protector and gatekeeper for Antonio on one side and Julia on the other because it's Tatiana, who writes to the family and gives them news of Gramsci, and in reverse brings news of the family that is written to her but not him, and relays that back to him. So it's through Tatiana that Gramsci finally learns of Julia's difficulties, not only at home with um, Eugenia and with her illness, but because they also suspect or she feels that there's surveillance at work. 
because by then Julia is working for OGPU, which is the forerunner of the NKVD, which became the forerunner of the KGB. In other words, she's working within the security services. So fairly obviously, there's a very strong chance that in fact she is under surveillance. Um, Tatiana also reveals just how disorganised uh, the domestic arrangements of the of the Schutz are, how very peculiar their lifestyle is, um, and also reveals some of the tensions which have always existed within the family. So in the, the next chapter then, we, I look at the relationship between Gramsci and Julia as revealed by the letters. Um, and I think we always have to remember here, when you see how awkward and fractured this correspondence is, about how little time they'd spent together and really how little they knew each other. They never, ever lived together. Even when he was in Moscow, she appears to have lived with the family and he lived in a shared hotel room. So if he wanted to spend any private time with her, he had to tell his roommate to go and make himself scared for a night or two or whatever. Or they went off and disappeared into this little magical wood hut in the woods where they made coffee and omelettes and, and, and were alone. Um, so I think the marriage never really develops, it's never really, never really gets past, as he says, hi Julie, the, the honeymoon stage. They're always still in the honeymoon stage where they're tiptoeing around each other and being perfect. Um, they never have a chance to simply become friends and comfortable with each other. Um, and the gaps in the correspondence sometimes aren't Julia's fault. The letters have sat in an office in Ogpu waiting to be posted or waiting for a clerk to look through them before they're sent. Or they get sent to Tatiana, but Tatiana's in hospital and they don't get forwarded. So um, it's not entirely, it's not entirely Julia's fault. And of course, Gramsci's entirely, completely inhibited by the knowledge of censorship. Um, so he can't ever say what he really means. And he's also inhibited by the feeling that when he writes to Julia, he ought to be writing something significant and interesting. Um, and not trivial, trivial chat like a file clerk, as he says. So they both complain that they haven't enough detail about the other's life to make writing easy, you know, in order to be able to say, well, you know, what happened about this and what happened about that? And are you feeling better? They simply don't know enough. But neither of them does anything much about it. Gramsci, because he says prison life is so dull and squalid that there aren't any interesting details to say, and then he feels that Julia, who does in fact give him news of the boys and herself, doesn't do it in the detailed, structured way that he needs in order to be able to construct a picture of him, that it's so that he can think, you know, about this time in the day the boys will be doing X. And I know that they always go home to do Y. You know, he's got no real overall picture and that's what he needs. But she does try to tell him how she feels. She does say what the boys are doing. Um, she tells him about their funny remarks and uh, the things that they do when they're in the country. She tells him about the, when she eventually admits that she has been really very ill. She's obviously suffered, I think, a deep, deep depression. Probably triggered from the postnatal depression and then flu right from the time that Juliana was born. But it's been diagnosed variously as epilepsy and hysteria and some other sort of long word. And eventually she starts psychoanalysis and counselling. And that does work much better than anybody else has, has, has done, although Gramsci does, is, is a bit sceptical about it. But he's pleased that she's... Uh, um, She's pl he's pleased that she's progressing, um, but he still complains bitterly about the lack of letters. And in fact, that's actually quite unfair because although there's only 37 letters in the archive, the official correspondence archive, there are others in her papers which look like drafts of letters or letters that are full letters and may or may not have been sent, but they're not stamped by the prison. So nobody knows whether Gramsci actually got them. 
But I sat and went through all Gramsci's letters and picked up all the references when he says he's had a letter from her. And I reckon that he got actually not 37 letters, but at least 60, probably going on towards 70 letters from her, which still isn't a lot over 11 years. But then he only wrote 74 letters to her when you actually count. Granted, there may have been letters lost in both directions, but not very many more. So he's got no cause to complain, really. He was just as bad. Um, but there is a point when he refuses absolutely to write to her, to her. And it's only when they hear from Apollon that firstly, she has been very ill and they've been concealing that from him. Um, that Eugenia is hostile and obstructive and that they are worried about surveillance from the authorities, that he begins to realise that she's in prison too. He's been a prison, imprisoned officially, but she is imprisoned by her life and her commitments, and in a way by her love for him. She can't do anything about her life. And it's then that he writes an apology to her for his past unkindness due to his ignorance of her circumstances. And the correspondence from that point in 1931 starts to improve again until, of course, he starts to be ill again and then it starts going downhill. So the chapter sort of follows the ups and downs of their correspondence, which generally follows the ups and downs of their, of their health. But they're very often out of step with each other, partly because of the gaps. I should be interested to know when this correspondence reaches the official volume of all the work, Gramsci's works, whether they're going to put Julia's letters in on the date that they were written or whether they're going to put them in again at the date that he received them. Because if they put them in at the date she wrote them, sometimes they took six, six weeks or a year to meet, to meet him, to reach him. So you're not going to get his response until a year later. So really they need to do both. They need to annotate that Julia wrote to him in August and this year and then put in when the letter actually arrived in August the following year. Well, but I don't suppose they can do that anyway. So that you can see there's always this disjunction between what they say and the response that they get back. Graham, she says, it's, it's like the Norwegian le legend of, of the two giants who yell at each other from mountain to mountain once every hundred years or so. Um, so um, the, the communication does, he becomes really ill in 1933 to 34 and doesn't write to anyone. There's, a, there's an 18 month gap when Julia keeps in, in contact with, um, with him via Tatiana. And then at the end, he does begin to write to her really kindly. In, um, in 1934, I think, when he realises that he is, you know, very seriously ill and may not live, he writes, My dear, you've always been one of the essential elements of my life. Even when I've had no precise news of you or received letters from you that were rare or without vital substance, and even when I didn't write to you because I didn't know what to write or how to write. And he goes on to say that he now finally wants her to come to see him because their states of mind, he thinks, are very similar. I do believe that you can do much for me, and I believe that I too can do something for you. Not much, but something. My dear, I pour all my tenderness into what I'm writing, although it doesn't appear so from the written words. So he's begging her finally to come and see him. And of course, Eugenia, as ever, puts her foot down and she doesn't come. And so they never, ever meet again. And he dies of a stroke three days after he has been officially freed, which is terribly sad and they're, they're separated, I feel, by their own perceptions of how perfect they need to be for the other and by their perceptions of what can and can't be told to the other in case of injuring the other. So in the end, um, they create their own barbed wire barriers, which they cannot get past. And then I finish telling you what happens to them all next. Okay.
Thank you, Whistle Stop Tour, but you, I mean, obviously I've left out oodles of details about the actual letters, which I quote. I was allowed to quote from Julia's letters, but only bits of Julia's letters, simply because they haven't been published yet. And they're waiting to put them into the big official book. Mm -hmm. So once they're published, Jenny, does that mean that you will be able to say yes, more? I imagine so, yeah about the, the richness of them. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. You saw all the clapping hands. The problem with them in Zoom is you can't hear the claps, can you? <laughs> um, but yes, thank you so much. That was great. And there's some, I don't know whether you've got people visible on your screen, but you've got some clapping hands emojis and some thumb up <laughs> emojis from people as well. So thank you so much, Jenny. Um, we've got time for a few questions and, and we're going to finish at six o'clock and it was just such a rich... Um, I don't know, such a rich uh, account of that massive analysis work that you have done over time. Um, and amazing that that gap of 11 years, that, that that's how long those letters were passing backwards and forwards. Yeah. And also the period of gaps between them so that there could be, you know, a year or two between those, yeah. um, between yeah. those, those, those letters. Um, yes, yeah, so anybody got anything that they would particularly like to ask or say? I'm sure this conversation will continue for <laughs> years anyway, Jenny, but... Well, it took years because, of course, I could only do it when I got to Rome and then they withdrew these wretched letters for a yeah. couple of years. So I couldn't do anything anyway. Yeah, of course. Derek, you've got a question. Sorry, I can't hear. No, it's, it's fine, Derek. Maybe it's now. Time. Right. Can All you right. hear me now? We yes, can. I can. Hi, yeah. Jenny. Um, OK. Um, I think the main thing I would like to say, just two, uh, two, very, very, uh, two very quick points. First of all, it wasn't until about 10 or a dozen years ago that the, some of the letters were real. It was realised that they were to Eugenia, yes. Evgenia, and yeah. not to Julia. Julia. Um, and I think everything started from there. Um, the other point, just the other major point, um, Jenny has gone through a lot of material that I haven't seen, to be honest. Um, but I'm not entirely convinced of the um, the reconstruction of the re relationship between Gramsci and. Eugenia, Yevgenia, when they were in the sanatorium. Um, it's not still not clear to me on the basis of what I've seen, uh, who made the approaches to whom? No. Him to her or her to him? I have the suspicion that it was her to him, but that that's only my reading, right? That, uh, no, no, I, won't I, go, I wouldn't, I won't go any, I wouldn't on any further. It's best if I mute the mic, mic and other people can come in. Thank Jenny, you, Derek. Do you, Thank do you, you. want to respond? Yeah. Did you, Jenny, did you want to respond to that or are you... No, no, I wouldn't argue with Derek's, I wouldn't argue with Derek's analysis that it may well have been Eugenia who was much keener than, than Gramsci was, although um, uh, there is there is another book which is uh, you know fictional called um, Absent Love by by another author in which um, Eugenie comes out as somewhat of a sexual predator almost. Um, but given the other things that we we read about Eugenie about her extreme sort of prudishness as a young woman, I do find that difficult. I do find that difficult to imagine. But I do agree with Derek that that at least in in the in the sanatorium it was certainly 50-50, if not Eugenia, you know, being very much keener on Gramsci than the other way around. Mm -hmm. Great, because thank you. Because he gave her her life back. She mm -hmm. was just going to lie in this in this sanatorium for years and years, unable to do anything without him. And I think he valued her past life. He listened to her. He was interested, very interested in the work that she'd done in education. And I think he gave her her self-worth back and then she was able to start moving. And um, she writes little pieces about how lovely it was. You know, they built bonfires when the snow melted. And, you know, she was, yeah, she was very keen on him. And that's why she was so bitter when, when he left. Mm. 
So we've got two, two questions, which will probably take us to time, which is one from Aidan and one from Maria. So Aidan, do you want to, to go next? Thank you very much, and 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 thanks so much, uh, Jenny. It's such a rich story, and and of such an extraordinary and very unusual set of uh, relationships, and and the work, the the detailed work you've done is is quite magnificent. I mean, I, I can't speak to that, um, uh, but I I have one little takeaway, I think, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, and it's 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 almost a methodological um, um, uh, point. Um, and it has to do with you know how we read how we read narratives and read letters and what what struck me is this this idea of health and gaps. So you mentioned how the the the, the letters are deeply um, uh, connected with the state of health of the of the writers and the gaps between the writing, and that struck me as just as an interesting methodological uh, idea that how we write about ourselves or read narratives even, need to pay attention to the health condition of the writer, and indeed perhaps even of the reader. Yes. Um, and that continuity and disruption in narratives is something that we, we must pay great attention yes. to. Yeah. But thank you for that. I have, a, I think, as I say, that one methodological key and very interesting take, uh, take away from it. Thank you. And that's lovely because that leads to Maria's question and Maria's obviously done lots of work on letters, so... <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much. I was so much looking forward to it and, of course, to reading the book. Uh, and I'm even uh, keener now. Uh, my question is also a bit of epistemological or methodological. It's rather a comment and a question, perhaps. I was very much struck by what you said in, in uh, towards the end, that uh, about the temporal difference of writing and receiving letters. So I found this temporality, this fragmented temporality, particularly interesting, because usually when we talk about correspondence, sometimes we have letters missing, so somebody's writing and we don't have the answer, or the other way around, but it's the first time I have ever dealt with letters that, um, you know, I encounter such a, such a peculiar temporality. And then I was thinking about your own temporality because I know how many years you have been working <laughs> with these letters. Um, and I wanted to ask you whether you, how you, you need to comment on any of it, but it's something so precious that I'm taking from today, Sandra, amongst others, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think, I think what I gained with the gaps in between is that, of course, A, I had time to talk to people like Derek and that, you know, that helped me sometimes to sort out the knots in the Italian, but also because my own Italian came back and became more fluent in the meantime. You know, when, when you start going back to Italy and talking and talking with people and talking past that first letter of transactional Italian, you know, when you start talking politics and philosophy and education and then you're forced to, to, to sort of expand and, and, and refresh your own language. So in some ways it was a good thing because I think I got, I mean, obviously I translated them and edited them and went back and, and then went back and thought that passage isn't right. I must go back and just look at that letter for that passage because I know it doesn't read properly. And I mean, I've yet to show my translations to someone like Derek, of course, who might be able to help me with some of the difficult bits still. Um, so, uh, and it is, yeah, it, the temporality in a way worked for me, I think, from the point of view of language. And I should say here, for those of you who don't know, that, that some of the sources, there are two sources which are in fact in English. One is Derek's translations of Gramsci's early letters called A Great and Terrible World, which has been really useful. And the other one I have used is the English translation of the letters from prison. So I refer to those so that people can actually look up the real letters if they want to. Mm -hmm. Well, Jenny, what a fabulous presentation, but what a fabulous labour of love. And really, just to say congratulations to you. Um, we're delighted that you've published this monograph and it was just so lovely to hear you speak about it tonight. Um, hopefully you'll do more 
conference presentations on this <laughs> as we go. And for those of you that have just joined us for the first time or are relatively new to the group, that's one of the things we're all missing is the opportunity to get together for our conferences. Because of course, when we do get together in those physical spaces, we're able to hijack people after sessions and have these lovely long conversations and often over a nice glass of wine. So for those of you that are not familiar with our world um, as a group, please do come and join us for other things, particularly when we do come face to face again. 